Okay, so uh, we will start the first uh, plenary session. So it's a great honor for me to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dominique Karboski from Argonne National Lab. But uh, just before uh, doing the presentation of uh, Dominique, I just want to uh, say that um, Simona was first uh, announced on the website, but she cannot come due to her pregnancy. Uh, so I want to excuse her. She's also IPC uh, vice chair. Uh, and so uh, immediately after uh, she cannot come, uh, we ask uh, to Dominique. And uh, of course, it was a real pleasure that is available uh, to do his uh, plenary uh, session. So um, Dominique, um, all the people. Uh, is the technical manager of uh, intelligent eco-mobility at Argonne National Lab in Chicago. And uh, his research interests include automotive system simulation, control theory, energy management, electrified powertrain design and optimization, as well as driver behavioral modeling. And he will uh, give us a keynote uh, speak about eco-driving control for connected and automated ve vehicles. So please. Applause, uh, Dominique. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, everyone. Bonjour. Um, thank you, first of all, to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me, especially uh, Dominic, the, the other Dominic, the main one here, <laughs> and uh, uh, Guillaume. And thank you for the, uh, for the nice introduction. So um, today I'm going to present you work at Argonne uh, at the intersection of energy management, autonomous driving, and, and connectivity, so some of the keywords that uh, Dominic mentioned during uh, his introduction. So I'd like to highlight this is uh, my work, but also and mainly the work of my colleagues, Namdo Kim, Daling Shen, JJ Jong, Ji Han, and JJ will be actually presenting at one of the sessions. So first, um, as you probably know uh, by now, connectivity and automation can enable uh, eco-driving. So sensors, V2X, maps uh, allows the vehicle to see now and in the future. So automation also allows you allows the vehicle to be driven by itself. So that these two technology combined allows you to do eco driving by enabling you to do some optimization how the uh, optimizing the vehicle speed and the energy consumption as well. So our approach and our objectives is to really uh, and we're doing this work for the Department of Energy um, in, the, in the United States. And the objective is to have uh, uh, an estimation of real world impacts of connected automated vehicles uh, uh, controls. So first controls that work on entire missions, cruise control, intersection approach, traffic and car following, as well as for real world routes with real world grain. Um, we're Given our um, experience, a lot of us work was on hybrids and advanced technology vehicles, uh, energy management. We're also very interested at in the intersection uh, of um, this um, eco driving control and powertrain. So we, we, would, we, we researched powertrain aware um, uh, control optimization algorithm, and we were also working so with conventionals, EVs, uh, and HEVs. And finally, one aspect of the work is to, to work toward real-world implementability, so we don't have yet vehicles uh, that we're testing on this, but we're, we're trying to be as close as possible in simulations. So our approach is twofold. First, we, we start by, you know, if, if, you, if you know the horizon of, your, um, of the, what's going to happen in the, the, the future, what is the optimal control and state trajectory for the future? So you use uh, various uh, optimization techniques, such as optimal control, uh, quadratic programming, simulated dynamic programming, 
but then you also need to have some frameworks to be able to um, implement that in the real time. So you want to have um, some MPC, for example, feedback loops, take into account the, the transit dynamics. Um, so w once we have the, the, these type controls, then we, we simulate these in, in these um, um, using a tool called Roadrunner, which we developed uh, uh, at Argon, and uh, I'll, I'll introduce uh, briefly later. So we have different, we'll, we'll look at different driving scenarios, different powertrains, and what are the energy impacts. So first, let's have a look at the optimization algorithms for eco-driving. So the first one I'm gonna introduce you is one that deals with a um, speed-only optimization, if, if you want. So uh, in here, we use as a cost function what I call acceleration energy, so we the sum of the square of the acceleration. So we're trying to minimize this. Um, the states are the distance and the acceleration of the of the vehicle. Uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the distance and the speed, the acceleration is the control variable here. So very simple dynamics, simple cost, cost, but that that allows us to have simplified model and uh, analytical solution. <coughs> so keep in mind here that it's not sensitive to grade. It is not also not sensitive to, um, to the type of powertrain. So the good thing, it can be applied to any powertrain um, fairly easily without modification. Um, so the, uh, given the simplicity of the, the, the problem, we can, uh, we can have analytical optimal solutions. So we're using mainly parabolic trajectories. So you have uh, acceleration, speed, and position here displayed. On the left is the inactive state constraint, meaning we don't have a vehicle in front of, uh, well, or there's no vehicle or the vehicle is, uh, we, we don't consider it. And then the two other cases, we, we either try to, we meet the vehicle at certain points or we follow it for a certain uh, distance. In this case, we generally assume, we assume the, the vehicle, the preceding vehicle to go at a constant speed. So the next um, uh, optimization algorithm, uh, this one combines really powertrain and speed control together. So really here, the eco-driving problem is more complex. We look at explicitly minimizing the energy of the vehicle. Uh, the dynamics we consider, so not only the vehicle dynamics as previously, but also the powertrain dynamics. Um, so the commands here are the torques uh, for the vehicle, so it depends on the, 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 the architecture of the vehicle. So for in the most complex one, so the one we're trying to do right now, uh, we're doing right now is the hy parallel hybrid, for example. So you have the two, the engine torque, motor torque, uh, the um, uh, gear number, and also the clutch state, as well as the brake braking. And the states also state distance and speed. And if you have uh, a hybrid, then you introduce also the state of charge of the battery. So in this case, we have a por uh, powertrain specific. Um, it, the, every solution will be powertrain specific, um, and but it takes into account grade. Uh, it really tries to take advantage of the part of the powertrain uh, that it's associated with, and um, it, but the, the downside is that it requires some some numerical solvers at some points, even though there's some analytical formulations, um, and has the greater complexity. So we apply the um, so. Uh, Bontragin minimum principle um, here. So the Hamiltonian here is the power, um, so which depends on the type of uh, architecture. So it's either fuel, electric, or a mix of uh, fuel and uh, battery. And that's where we, we introduce another uh, battery co-state, battery SOC co-state. Um, and then um, so the, the, the vehicle dynamics, so the V dot and S dot here. So the PMP conditions, um, are, are stated here, but basically we from these equations we derive that we have a, a constant Hamiltonian for the for the uh, for the trip and also a constant uh, lambda s. So then the 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 control policy, the optimal control policy here is to 
Um, so to find a minimum, the, the torques and the, uh, or in this case it's an electric vehicle, the command that minimizes the Hamiltonian. Uh, and this is a function of the speeds and function of these two other parameters, uh, little h, gothic h, and uh, lambda s. So here this plot displays how these, the trajectory of the, um, the torques, the, co uh, the braking, the co-states, and the distance evolves as a function of uh, uh, speed. So w what we do is that we, we solve the problem uh, in a piecewise fashion. So we decompose the entire trip in segments where we consider constant grades, um, which is, um, you may think that this is a, it's not realistic, but actually we look, we work with also real world grades that we get from here maps. And we're able, we, we design an algorithm to kind of split them in, um, in, in, in piecewise constant uh, segments. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly valid proposition or reasonable uh, proposition. So anyway, we, we, so we, we, we um, uh, chop, if you want, the, the trip in these little segments. We, uh, we find the, the optimal steady state for, uh, speed uh, eventually the vehicle will reach. Um, and then the, the challenge is to solve these jump conditions, so finding the right speeds that will work for both the, from the, the segment at n minus one and the segment at n, and as well n plus one. And these trajectories depend really on that uh, uh, h and lambda s. And these are somehow related to your travel time. So what I presented previously was more fo focused on if there's no other uh, vehicle in, in, in front of you that may uh, pose an, a, a constraint. So uh, um, in this case, it's not, uh, uh, how to say, it's not as easy as in the previous optimization algorithm to solve for a preceding algorithm. So what we do here, we do an iterative process where we consider point constraints. So we have to be insert at certain points in at, uh, at a given time and position. Um, so we solve that iteratively. Um, so we, if we find a collision, that there is a collision between the preceding vehicle and our ego vehicle, um, then we're gonna try to find where are we the furthest uh, or, or the most problematic, problematic point, and we, we're gonna kind of move that trajectory uh, upwards, and we're gonna create a point constraint until we manage to, to reach our um, um, a, a trajectory that does not collide. <coughs> Finally, um, one, one work we, uh, we've done, and this my, uh, my colleague Dalian Chen presented that actually at the uh, ECOSM la uh, last year uh, in, uh, in China. So this one, uh, in this case, we do optimal periodic control. So we, so we slightly change some of the assumption. We no longer change, we reach that optimal steady state speed. Uh, so we have it result in a pulse and glide um, the type of control. Um, and we, we can reach here uh, in some specific conditions uh, about four to five percent fuel saving uh, with reasonable, fairly reasonable periods of the which, and which will lead to reasonable uh, levels of uh, comfort or discomfort uh, for the passengers. So finally, um, we also looked at win, uh, intersection approach. So this is the so, so when you when you have traffic lights ahead of you, there are some technologies that allow you to know the signal phase and time. So meaning you will know when the 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 if it's green, how long the the traffic light will stay green, and if it's red, when it will turn back to to green. So um, so. For example, for DSRC or some other techniques, you, uh, the vehicle can receive that information. So now you can use that information to, as an additional constraint or uh, for your optimization algorithm. So but that's what we call eco approach. So generally, if you look at, uh, uh, if you do some s simulation or experiments, you'll see that for in this case, uh, 
we have distance on the y-axis and time in the x-axis. And you see in the first case, the vehicle um, accelerates before the red light uh, versus the other one where some just idle on the traffic light. And the, in the case four, we managed to, to go uh, at the next green phase without having to stop. So of course there's a bit of slowing down, but you don't actually stop. And then you have the corresponding um, energy consumption and that case four is the one with the lowest fuel consumption. So that, that allows us to design a simple rule for w when you wanna get to your uh, traffic light. So if the light is currently green, you look at what is your, um, uh, if you, you, know, you also have the distance and, and time uh, space here and you look at whether you can make it at just before the start of the transition to the uh, red phase. Uh, and if that speed is, is greater than your maximum speed, then you're, you'll, you'll wait until the next phase and then you have that red speed uh, as your target speed. And likewise, if it's red, you, uh, you, you, you try to look when you'll be able to, uh, uh, to get to the gr green light and you compare that to your uh, maximum speed as well. So these simple uh, rules allows us to have some horizon that we use in the uh, optimization when we do a case where we also assume the vehicle to be connected. So they're, all, they're generally always automated, uh, but it can be also automated and connected. So, so far I presented you the optimization algorithm. So um, as I mentioned a little bit in, uh, in the beginning, we would like to have uh, eventually to implement them, being able to test, test them um, beyond just uh, simulation. So first, we, when we started this, this, initiated this work three years ago, we, we were using tools that basically use a fixed drive cycle, and um, so that's it. So you use a drive cycle, one vehicle, and that's how you do your simulation for energy management. Uh, well, if you try to do eco-driving or any forms of uh, work on uh, an automated vehicle where the speed is dynamically affected, you need something a little bit more better. So there are some advanced tools with like 3D, but we thought that there was something missing that allows us to do multi-vehicle simulation with connectivity automation while still being relatively simple to deal with and ability to run a large number of uh, scenarios, because what matters for energy uh, is generally running a long type of real world trips and lots of them to have like good, good meaningful um, uh, results at the end. Versus safety where you try to just model particular instances, a lot of them as well, uh, but m it's more short particular instances. So Anyway, so this is just a diagram of the, <coughs> the Simulink, the, the, that, that framework is in Simulink. Um, so it's multi-vehicle, as you can see in this example, you have three of them, so it's think of them as kind of following one after the other. Um, within each vehicle, you have uh, sensors and V2X block that kind of receives all the information from the environment and the other vehicles. Uh, human or control, uh, um, human or automated driving control, and the powertrain and the um, sometimes supervisory, depending if, if, if where if we don't change the, the the control of the vehicle, is using autonomy. Autonomy is a, also another tool that we develop at Argon, but that's the one I just mentioned previously with drive cycle. So focus on powertrain um, design optimization energy management. And there's also a route uh, or the route uh, the road uh, model here where we have the speed limits, the grade, the intersection, the traffic lights. And here we, uh, we link with here maps, so we are able to extract information for any type of real world uh, route. So get all the grades, where the exact position of traffic lights, the road classes, speed limits, so forth, so on. So that's, that's the, the simulation framework where we, we, where we wanna test our controllers. So, as you, as you saw, they're a little bit more analytical, more uh, math-oriented or theory, so now you have to actually have them work in a some <coughs> somehow more uh, real-time. 
So <coughs> to that end, we're using model predictive uh, control. So the, the goal here is to use information about maps, sensors, V2X, feed that to a controller that commands the power train, the power train provides back the, the state. So we start by, um, I'm, I think you, you, most of you are probably familiar with MPC, but uh, generally you start with having some horizon, so uh, what predicting the future constraints, so that's a little bit some of the, uh, uh, I touched about that a little bit earlier. Um, then we go through optimization. So we try to find the optimal trajectory over uh, uh, a certain horizon. Um, and we apply the first command that comes from that optimization. The rest is kind of discarded. So we do that, but then at the next step, we redo that same process all over again. So basically, that allows us to have that concept of receding horizon and to have uh, uh, in a way, a feedback loop every time we, uh, we update. So <coughs> in the optimization, that's where we can have different types of solvers, uh, whether it's the, the most kind, the, the typical one is quadratic programming. Um, so we've done some here, I'm not gonna discuss too much about here uh, today, but um, that one can also be uh, used. Uh, PMP, that's so optimal control for the speed only. Uh, and uh, PMP for speed and powertrain, so the two optimization algorithm I, I presented earlier. <coughs> and as I mentioned, you have that feedback loop so that every time step, you update your horizon uh, you based on how the vehicle perform or if there is new information. So typically, it's, it's quite difficult to predict what the, the preceding vehicle will do. So in, if you do it in this framework, it allows you to constantly update uh, your uh, your, <coughs> your optimization, your problem statement, if you want. So, so you, you'll be able to rerun your optimization at each time step. Um, and yeah, so and also you you have you will deal with the imperfection of your of the model using optimization, right? So you and though we try to use we we do some linearizations here and there to make the the analytical uh, solutions pos possible, <coughs> but in the in the the plant model we use lookup table, and if you in the real world, well, it's it's the real system, so you don't always have the exact system. There's always some uncertainty, uh, so you have to deal with that. And dynamics such as uh, turbo lag, if you have a turbocharged engine, you'll have to kind of account for the fact that maybe you won't always always get your torque your engine torque when, you, when you're requesting it. So it's kind of, this is a very a screenshot of then like how we implemented the, the, um, these algorithms. So I'm not gonna necessarily dig into what these blocks are, but just to, to highlight that um, there's the interface with, uh, with the plan models that are, uh, where there are complex dynamic systems. So there's transients, constraints, delays, um, so basically, there's a distinction between the optimization model and the uh, and the plant model. I'll mention it works for the entire mission, uh, and I'm going to present on the the, the, the following uh, slides the two optimization options: there are speed and acceleration, powertrain, and speed co-optimization. So then um, the um, uh, and then there's also the eco approach, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So now let, let's have a look at some uh, results. So we, we run uh, a case study. So the simulation setup is that we have, we look at uh, two types of vehicle, conventional and uh, a battery electric vehicle. Um, we're in the process of adding the hybrid vehicle, but it's not there yet. So coming back soon, coming, coming soon. Uh, we'll look at real world routes. Um, so we extract information about these routes from uh, here maps, so th this could be potential real world trips. Um, so so a, a, a mix of suburban, uh, urban, highway, and mixed vehicles. So in this case, it's more uh, in the US, uh, but if you guys would like, we can all, all, all always uh, bring some European routes as well. Uh, so the scenario is that we always have two vehicles simulated. Uh, 
the first uh, um, two vehicles, and there's a combination of um, a baseline, which is there's no optimization, so it can be analogous to a human driver, uh, and one of the controls. So either you have uh, one baseline, one control in either position, uh, two baselines, or two controls. So the, and there, so basically, it's a, it's a, if you want, it's a zero, fifty, or hundred percent penetration of the con the automated technology here. We also look at whether we have or not the signal phase uh, of timing. So it's zero percent, so no light provides that information and it's not used at all, or a hundred percent of the light. Um, and then we have so the three controls that I, uh, I, I, I summarize here. You have the baseline, as I mentioned, again, human, kind of human drivers, so you no optimization. Speed acceleration only, so we, uh, we leave the supervisory to do uh, the, the high level uh, energy management. And the one where we, we try to optimize everything at once. So the eco drive, powertrain, and speed. So these are the, the results on some uh, on th these um, uh, this route. So this is for the um, um, so you have uh, um, just then there will be the common legend here. The red one is the baseline, blue one is the speed and uh, speed optimization only, and green is speed and powertrain. The darker color means we are adding V2I, so meaning that we have that eco approach knowledge about the traffic light state. Um, in this case, I this is the energy consumption, the, the, the percentage uh, change compared to the baseline case. Uh, conventional on top and electric vehicle at the bottom. And here, we're uh, looking at the lead vehicle. So kind of the lead vehicle has no other vehicle in front of it. So and we'll discuss later about whether that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, but anyway, in this case, um, we can see that, uh, and. Anyway, you have like so also highway, mixed, and suburban, urban type scenarios. So, um, so only we, we, we generally speaking, we, we get uh, between three to ten percent savings from just the speed uh, optimization only. We get uh, an additional, um, I think, something like three to five coming extra additional from uh, V2I, and obviously more on urban scenarios, and some additional percent between one and five percent from the adding the powertrain also in the mix. So these are also preliminary results. We're working on refining them. Uh, our current deadline is uh, end of September to kind of wrap up this three-year project for, for the US Department of Energy. Um, one interesting result is that if you look at the following vehicle, uh, uh, basically a, a, a vehicle following a lead vehicle that is equipped, uh, but uh, I mean a non-equipped vehicle following an equipped vehicle. So imagine you're, you're in your, your clunker car uh, or maybe your collection car, that car you guys, very nice car you guys showed in, in your picture earlier on, and you're following this brand new a uh, car from the future that has the connectivity and automation, right? So you actually also benefit in terms of fuel savings here uh, to 10%. Um, so you can look a little bit where these savings come from. So primarily, and this is for the conventional, the bottom you see the tr uh, positive tractive energy. So you see that most of it uh, in comes from reduction in the tractive energy. That's where you're gonna have the most savings. So so you minimize tractive energy by basically also minim reducing how much you break, right? So that's kind of also maybe some of you do when you try to drive uh, efficiently. Um, and one also interesting result is that because you have, you reduce your tractive load, you reduce your uh, engine load, you also reduce your engine efficiency. So your engine efficiency goes down by 8%. So that's uh, about 3 Percent, uh, percentage points here. Um, so if you're like 35, you'll go down to 32%. So um, that's maybe some interesting result that maybe when uh, to all the people here or researchers working on engine control optimization, maybe that's an opportunity to do more. Uh, maybe there's some optimization at that level. Um, so those are a little bit the results, and as I mentioned, we'll, we're working on improving them. 
So one question is, what about the baseline, right? You can find a very bad baseline to make the results look better. Uh, and also, there's no one human driver. It depends how it is, right? So we also starting to trying to, to model that. So human driving is complex, and it really depends on the context where you're driving. So this is a, 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 a a little plot of one unconstrained real, real world driving. Uh, so you have a, a first phase that consists of accelerating. You press on the acceleration pedal, and also where you're kind of cruising. A little phase around 50 seconds where you're uh, coasting, so you're not pressing any pedal, and then you're braking. <coughs> and if you look at the different uh, regimes for different similar scenarios, they're a little bit all over the place. So how do we model that? How do we understand why people do it this way and not another way? So f of course, there'll be a part of it is stochastic, but part of it is context. So we have to understand the context. So we, we're, um, we're collecting um, data, on-road data. Um, so I call it rich on-road data, where we have geolocation, dash cam cameras, a radar information, so we can know the, the position of the vehicle ahead of you as well as the CAN and powertrain uh, signal. So of course, there requires a lot of processing, filtering, uh, image recognition. Uh, so that the goal here is to give you the context of the driving. So what is the road type? What is the speed limit ahead of you? What, are, where, what type of intersection you have? Also, what are the surrounding uh, vehicles uh, out there? So, and this is a little video that shows like how we look at the data and we try to, uh, to, to detect, to know what the traffic light is. So, so we can know the state, so we will know when you look at the data what, uh, w why the vehicle stopped. At least that will give us an extra uh, information. So from the maps, we know there's a traffic light here, but this gives the, the additional information that what was the state when it changed the first time. So we use uh, deep learning, you'll see it'll soon change to green, hopefully, otherwise this car is stuck. And this is in Chicago, uh, uh, not exactly where the lab is, uh, is located, but there you go. So I invite you to, to visit, it's a very nice city. Um, a little bit taller. Um, so then, okay, what do we do with the, uh, once we have that data? So uh, we devised, kind of we, we split a little bit the, the model we're gonna do of that driver into a, a perception and an action model. So perception means like what type of uh, regime you are in. So acceleration, deceleration, cruising, if you're braking, but also parameters. So what is your, what is your cruise speed? What is your uh, brake, uh, you know, how, 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 how hard you wanna brake? So that, these things are more data driven. So you have the data set, we will use machine learning to find what are the, the appropriate parameters based on the input, on the context, as I mentioned. Um, but then you need to also compute what are the second by second speed trajectories. And for that, uh, we also do, surprisingly, optimal control. So we're modeling uh, the driver as a, um, as a brain that tries to minimize the jerk. Jerk is the derivative of acceleration. So if you think a good dr about a uh, good driver, a good driver just drives smoothly. And the smoothness comes from generally avoiding changing the acceleration too much. Um, and obviously, depending how you, what boundary conditions you provide, you'll have different types of drivers. Um, so this is really a combination of uh, these two. And then you can also add some imperfection, a little bit of stochasticity to, to model uh, this, some distribution you can see in the, the, the real world. Um, so some preliminary results. We, this is the result showing on 27 cases, so not that much at this point, but um, we hope to get more data uh, in, in the future. So um, you can see position, speed, and acceleration. You can see the acceleration matches decently well. And, and overall, we have a, a relatively good match between what we observe in the real world data 
and what we have in the um, in the model. So at this point, th these were the segments where there is no preceding vehicle that was constraining you uh, in, in how you were approaching the, the system. Um, well, what I've shown you a little bit, like when the, the, the result you, I showed you about the lead vehicle, the lead vehicle did not have any other vehicle uh, preceding it. So it was kind of open road, so you're driving in the middle of the night when there's no one else there. Uh, but in practice, there are, uh, there are times where you're constrained by other vehicles. So, we're, so how, how do we add this to, 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 to the mix? So um, two, two or several ways. Uh, one is to use the, the lead vehicle as a proxy for traffic. So imagine that uh, you're, if you look at just your vehicle, throughout the trip, you'll, you'll see other vehicle come in front of you and make it a little bit impossible to, to do what you want, right? So we have some other tools uh, that relies on machine learning and Markov chains that generate uh, speeds and with some traffic in there. So you can, if you provide traffic, and if, again, if you connect to, a, to here maps, you can get the traffic for any particular trip. So there, you can have these lead vehicles and you can make them appear or disappear so that you model that these vehicle appearing, disappearing in front of you and preventing you from driving how you want. So that's one, uh, one approach. Uh, so that will, and the other approach is to use environments that simulate the actual movements of many vehicles, uh, which greater, much greater fidelity of the environments. One is the a micro traffic flow micro simulation tool. So really where you, you can simulate thousands of vehicles and also we're working uh, um, on an autonomous driving simulator, uh, in which case it's a, maybe different, it's a kind of different objectives, but also simulates other vehicles in there. So one, we'll really we can look at the impact on the traffic flow, uh, we can try on more, on maybe more advanced environment models than we have in, uh, in the simulation in Roadrunner. So that allows us to have a greater, uh, eventually to have more robust control. So as I mentioned, one is more uh, traffic conditions for any trip, uh, and the other is more the higher fidelity traffic environment model. So this is an example of results in a, a micro simulation. So on the left, you have a human driver. The red vehicle is the one that, that we simulate in the Roadrunner. Uh, and on the right is the one with the speed optimization is V2I. So they're coming at a stop. It's fairly similar at this point. Um, but there is a little bit uh, differences that's hard to see here. Then the next phase, they're, they're coming to a traffic light. So it's green, uh, in those cases. And you see on the right, it turned red. So then the red vehicle start to adjust its speed, try to go slower. Uh, and versus in the baseline case, it just goes and will be waiting at a queue. So now you can you start maybe seeing, well, you need to really look at this situation a little bit better because first of all, maybe a lot of people will pass in front of you and will we'll do some, uh, will increase the queue. So you may not be able to really get where you think you were getting. You also maybe notice that there's there are some stopping that well, we didn't really plan for it, that happened. So, okay, wh why did it happen? That's something we need to, to look at. But really uh, interesting way of, well, going one step beyond and trying to solve some uh, uh, of these problems. Um, so also, so this, is, uh, this is when we use Carla, which is the open source uh, autonomous driving simulator. So same thing, we link, uh, we have our control Simula uh, that, that r runs, that we develop in Roadrunner, but we, in this case, we use the environment from that 3D um, um, uh, engine to really provide information about other vehicles, uh, traffic light status, et cetera. So one interesting research topic would be how do we integrate these eco-driving algorithm within, um, within more complex um, systems that actually have to do the autonomous driving, right? So eco-driving is not the top priority when you design an autonomous driving. First and foremost is 
uh, safety. So you have to have you have a lot of layers of control, and that has to in to come in there. So you cannot do so. Obviously, we try to we don't do we try to avoid collision, etc. But there's uh, there's maybe some controls that are designed specifically for that. So you have to interact with them as well. So hopefully, maybe that's one uh, research topic that that we'll look in the future. Um, now oh, another question, Does it, will it really work, right? So if we do all these things in simulation, it's all great, but who knows, right? So first, first baby step here is to uh, integrate uh, these controls in a, what we call in vehicle in the loop on the chassis dyno. So we have colleagues at Argonne that have got great chassis dyno facilities, uh, and they're also very ingenious and they can crack into uh, existing vehicles. They can override, read certain signals, they can override them. So for example, uh, they can, we took the Prius Prime PHEV that has uh, adaptive cruise control um, stock there and they were able to uh, insert what they call a man in the middle. So basically they can override what is the gap with the preceding vehicle uh, in the control. So there's one level so we can then simulate the vehicle in uh, the real vehicle in Roadrunner, so where the other vehicle, the, the preceding and following vehicles are virtual, and we can, uh, we can simulate how the stock controller works uh, in, in that context, so we can maybe do some validation work on that. And the next step is also to uh, implement our own control. So they also have the capability to uh, override the uh, the, the, some of the commands, actually the acceleration commands. So basically there's an ACC module that sends commands to the uh, supervisory. So we can, we can override that, what that ACC does. So we, we can implement our eco driving there. So that's one way of testing it. And we're in the process also of uh, uh, building a project where we'll be able to test on track with the control environment uh, with different traffic light configuration, different uh, scenarios, different interac interaction with other uh, vehicles. Uh, <coughs> and maybe as a conclusion, we've, I've presented you how to make uh, in single vehicles more uh, efficient. That's one way of doing it. And I think uh, many of you are, are, are looking uh, similar topic or maybe a little bit different approaches, but it's part of a much larger puzzle, like the transportation puzzle, and you see that there's multiple trends at once. Um, so think about starting from, uh, from you know, competent improvement, maybe some of you here are doing engine control, so you're trying to optimize how the engine works. There's also co-optimization co of engines and fuels. Uh, batteries, of course, are important. Uh, we saw individual vehicle design control, but then if we look, these are part of larger systems of, of vehicles moving on the road. So we have uh, traffic control, and there's actually opportunity to also optimize how uh, vehicle drive by better controlling the traffic. So um, you can, for example, coordinate how vehicle uh, interact, so you can maybe implement similar uh, optimization for multiple vehicles, or you can provide high-level guidance to what are the, the traffic that is, uh, um, or the, the speeds that will lead to um, smoother traffic. Um, automation provides the ability to, to uh, change some of the uh, issues that we're facing. So for, I don't know if you've seen, there's a, there's a, there's a, experiment that involves uh, vehicles following each other on a uh, circle or track in past a certain number and speed of the, of just to control one vehicle, it creates traffic jams. Uh, and, and that's how, and even though there's still room on the road, so there's these ghost traffic jams that happen and that sometimes you see like, why is there a traffic jam? So maybe automation allows you to be a little bit predictive about it and solve that. But, so that's more operation, but then you also have to look at how people use transportation. And if the, I guess the most important or the, the first order uh, uh, 
impact on energy is actually how, how, how far people travel, how much they travel. So we have to look also like at the metropolitan areas, how people make their travel decision and with new mobility services, for example, maybe they use less cars or more be, maybe actually it, even though people individually use less cars themselves, they actually use um, more of these TNC, the Ubers, the Lyfts, uh, and they use them more and then it results in more traffic and more fuel use. And that, for example, early results from uh, what happened in the, um, in, in the United States, in Chicago or New York City, you see that actually traffic went up, uh, transit, uh, public transportation trend uh, went down because people are using more of these convenient and cheap services. So you have to account for that as well. The system level optimization where you can maybe, or freight as well, where you can coordinate when people leave or when, when freight shipment leaves so you can pull them together in a more efficient way. And of course, this integrates into how the land is used, energy, uh, energy is produced, right? If, a, if an EV is not the same in a, uh, whether you have your, your electricity comes from coal or whether it comes from renewable, um, so forth so on. So just as a, a thought, so we also have colleagues at Argon working uh, on many of these different aspects. Uh, so maybe time for, a, for another talk, but these are also, there's a cross interactions between them. So one part of our work will be to also, okay, what if we put maybe 10, 20, 50% of our vehicles that we control this way in a larger network and what happens there. So that's, uh, now I'm, I'm op open for questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we have time uh, for uh, plenty of questions. Good morning. Um, thank you for that presentation. It was very interesting. Um, you mentioned real-time implementation. Um, what kind of limitations do you face with these types of advanced algorithms when you, if you want to deploy them in like an embedded hardware uh, system? Because from my understanding, um, that's a huge limitation that OEMs are facing nowadays which is when you have these advanced algorithms, they're all very nice and they work very well. But when it comes to implementing them in actual uh, target hardware, um, calibrating them and tuning them and actually having enough processing power to uh, get the results you require um, seems to be a challenge. So can you comment on how that's shaping up for you guys? Like, is there anything that's happening that uh, could help that uh, be better? Um, very good question, very good point here. Um, I don't necessarily have a good answer to this as we don't, we're not OEM, so we don't have the controllers in there. So we're, we're, um, we're working a little bit sometimes with OEMs so that they provide us some of the feedback on, okay, this is not realistic. We have, you know, that you cannot do. Um, there's also different trends. So one thing is also you have to think, well, we're thinking maybe production vehicles that potentially have, are having increasingly uh, very high computing power. Now that computing power will be already used by all the autonomous driving, right? They have all these fancy GPUs, are extremely powerful, sometimes more powerful than some of the desktop computers. So there's potential of using there. But one thing we tried to do here is that we used uh, like MPC, which is a um, uh, fairly common uh, concept and that is, that, that that has been implemented on some controllers, real-world controllers. But then also the optimization we use is not, you know, we're not using DP, which clearly uh, it goes much slower. You cannot run that real-time. So we're using what we think are nimble uh, algorithms. So um, there'll be, a, and just for one case, we, we already put some of the controllers in, let's say, uh, like a, for now, it was just a MATLAB uh, auto box, uh, sorry, a DSpace auto box, uh, when we tested the vehicles on the chassis dyno and worked without any problems. Now, these are a little bit different system that you have uh, in the real world, so that's something we'll, we'll try to, uh, to dig more uh, about. Uh, 
Uh, hi, thank you very much for your for your talk. Very interesting one. Um, I have two questions. First one is uh, when you show the um, the traffic environment with the optimal car, I see uh, it seems to me that there were uh, some uh, line changes. Was it uh, uh, there's an optimization on, on that level? No, in this case, um, so we could we so we implemented the. Um, the controller in uh, Aimson, and in this case, the lane change logic is from the Aimson. So there's so basically we control the longitudinal speed, and Aimson controls the lateral speed. So we c there's also opportunities to save some energy by optimal uh, lane change. Uh, that's not at this point we're not no, not looking at this. Thank you very much. And the second one is on uh, slide uh, 28. It's on um, when you use, um, you optimize by taking into account the powertrain criteria. I've, it seems to me, yes, there's a, on EV, there's a loss of uh, gain energy gained when you consider powertrain. Uh, are you able to explain it? Uh, th so there is saving, as, as I mentioned, for the, uh, so the result I showed in the following slide about the tractive energy that's being reduced. So that's more or less these levels, like in this case, was for conventional 30% reduction in uh, um, in tractive energy. So how much just kinetic energy you have to, or not kinetic, but power you have to provide uh, at the wheel. Uh, so this it's similar for the EV as well. So a lot of savings come from there. Um, there is some improvements. There's not much uh, improvements in like the. Uh, Efficiency, so it's fairly sy similar system, and also um, this system is actually uh, when we the, the different uh, you can see also we have um, sorry maybe here I mean yeah that was for the non-equipped but for the lead vehicle that is equipped uh, you can see that also the uh, sometimes the um, two optimization in blue and green have similar result that because for an EV. They're fairly similar because of the simplicity of the EV powertrain. Actually, leads to also s fairly simple uh, control logic. Do you have uh, other questions for the minute? Um, okay. Sorry, this question might be a little detail um, about your algorithm. You use um, ECMS to optimize the uh, trajectory, right? Not exactly. It's more the well. It, it's uh, the Pontryagin minimum principle, yes. which is can be similar. Um, Sorry, yes. And so it it, it 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 is similar in a way, but we do right. Yeah. And I think probably you can ask everything about uh, about this to to uh, the the illustrious uh, Professor Rizzoni here. But uh, you know, some of them they come from the same roots of, of, of yeah, PMP. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Sorry, sorry for that. And uh, also, but uh, my my question is that um, what what is the sample sampling time actually? Because in your algorithm, I suppose it's is it's supposed to be a supervisory algorithm, so it's like a system level. But uh, uh, in your implementation, you um, I see one figure that mentioned that. Uh, um, there, there is a more com complicated model. Like you can study uh, diesel transi transient uh, sort of thing. So, um, my my question is that uh, the system level um, algorithm is that if you use that algorithm into a more complicated, more specific model, does that still work and uh, guarantee? missing results because I'm quite com confused so uh, so yeah we have a uh, we use simplify models for the optimization model yes. the one we use to derive equations and derive the, the control they're linked to more complex nonlinear uh, models with dynamics uh, and we r these are run at uh, 10 milliseconds uh, sampling time in simulation um, they don't always need to be. Not everything needs to be at this, this, uh, the 
small time step, it can be a little bit higher, so we can have different uh, sampling time for certain maybe slightly higher level uh, objectives. So at this point, it was easier to work on the same sampling time, but it's we're, we're starting experimenting with that. And that's one way also of improving the real world implementation is that maybe having different sam sampling time from different functions so you don't you can spend the the computing resource more efficiently okay um okay thank you thank you <coughs> uh one of the questions that the uh uh, where the customer will be receptive to this kind of technology is the, uh, say for example, you have an eco approach, and you are the car that happen to be uh, have the old kind of uh, technology, so you're going to slow down, right? But the car behind you doesn't know what the heck you slow down for, right? And then the other possibility is like uh, you want to, uh, y y in the uh, when you are driving, you might not ha necessarily keep a constant speed, and and the uh, people behind you probably will be uh, very uh, curious what happened to you and what's your answer to that? It's a very good point. Uh, as you can see, that's something that happens even in simulations. These, these other car gets impatient uh, if you slow down too much for no good reason. So there's obviously you need to introduce some constraints into how much freedom you really have about how much you can slow down um, uh, when you're approaching traffic light. So um, for this, the, the, the best answer is that some of these needs to be experimented in the real world to see how people, other uh, drivers react. So we have some colleagues in the, at the Berkeley lab that, uh, that test some of the vehicles, some eco-driving uh, uh, strategies on the road and record trajectories uh, of other vehicles so we can see what is, what is acceptable, how, these, how possible are these things in the, in, in the real world. But it's a very good question. Yeah. Would that be included in the September? You, you mentioned that the September your project is going to be uh, complete, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're fortunate to be, to, there's going to be a follow-up. Uh, it's part of the Department of Energy, and we're national labs. So we're owned by the Department of Energy. So we're, there's continuing, uh, there'll be follow-up work. So uh, we'll continue working on this. So this is for our first kind of big, big milestone. So we'll not necessarily answer these questions uh, that, uh, that we discussed today. Um, the main new results we'll see was hybrids and hopefully we'll imp introduce some traffic as well in the results. Thank you very much. Thank you for this talk. I have a very short question. Did you make simulations where all cars have uh, such a system? Because in fact, what you could say at the end, um, if just one car has a system uh, which optimizing the speed, uh, maybe the result is um, sometimes surprising, not, not so good. But if all cars have uh, a compulsory system equivalent to this, um, what would be the benefit for this overall community? Uh, compared to uh, just one car or no car? It's a, it's a good question. So I think one of the next, so we did simulation where we have either n no zero, 50 or 100% penetration, although it's fairly simple where you have only two vehicles maybe that are equipped. So you can look, I did not show the results here on the, the following vehicle that is also equipped, right? Um, so. The one thing that we're gonna do is gonna, we're gonna use the traffic flow simulation where we can have different uh, levels of penetration. So, uh, so we're probably gonna see benefits even at lower, you know, you know 20, 30% uh, um, penetration. One thing that we'll also have to be uh, cautious about is that in this case, we kind of optimize w individual vehicle in an egoist egoistic fashion. As we mentioned already, the um, uh, uh, one uh, the previous question, there might be other people may react differently, but also it may create some traffic dynamics that are not uh, pr uh, predicted in the when we just look at a, at just a small number of vehicles. If you look at the ACC systems, the the stock vehicles, they are generally if you have too many of them on the on the highway, they will generate a traffic jams where a human driver wouldn't. So we, that's also one thing we want to 
to look at whether we actually want to make things worse by using some of these uh, algorithms. So, and, and later on, we'll also look at, uh, uh, you know, entire cities modeling. So we have the colleagues that, work, that model entire cities, how the transportation works. So we can then look at uh, where the, the, one thing that also that, that is uh, important to keep in mind is that the, the savings comes from the, uh, you know, how much the technology saves, how, how many uh, vehicles are equipped or the, pen, the, the technology penetration time, also the, how often people use it and um, meaning sometimes cruise control, maybe you don't always turn it on on the highway driving, for example. So will they turn on these features? And lastly, how far they travel. So all these are, are kind of combined and you have to take all of these account to really have maybe really so society uh, benefits. And there's a large body of work uh, kind of from the other side of the room in, in our big open space at Argonne that specifically works on urban and like long-term scenarios, what happens in these situations. Maybe we have time for one last short question. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. I have just one question on the powertrain level. Do you, what kind of model did you consider if you consider an average model or dynamic model? And if you consider a simple model, did you, I mean, uh, what is this level of sensitivity um, of your algorithm about the powertrain model? Thank so you. So uh, we use, um, uh, we use model, um, we develop a, a tool called autonomy, which is used for powertrain modeling. Uh, actually, that's main, uh, the main core expertise, the long-term expertise uh, of the, the lab and the, the team I work with. And, and a lot of these models are uh, validated. So when we have, like for example, the Prius I, I mentioned to you, the, we, have, we test the vehicle on the chassis dyno, then we validate all the operations, you know, when the engine turns on and off, um, what are the SOC uh, balancing strategies. We do model all of these. Uh, if, so it's, it's more a, a dynamic uh, model. Uh, now, so basically each component ha will have a, uh, mm, often a mix of physical modeling and lookup tables uh, that, that um, are related to efficiency. For example, the engine as a fuel rate map that comes from real world uh, f uh, engine maps, and that's coupled with uh, um, some dynamics that model the, the lags of the systems. Um, so, and we not only look at uh, existing system, but also future systems. So we work with other experts within the national lab complex um, uh, in the in the U.S. that that more focus, for example, on engines. So we have different, we look at, okay, what, what about 2040? What, how will be the engine's efficiency then? So we, we can model, uh, we work with them so we have better models of these potentially future technologies and we can do a comparison there. So in the case study I showed you, I just look at current technologies, but we also look at future technologies where there's gonna be improvements in the components as well. So they are likely to reduce the energy savings that we see uh, in, in here. Basically, the more efficient your baseline is, the less you can optimize it, right? Okay, okay uh, it's time, I think. So uh, let us uh, thank again uh, Dominic Karbowski for his excellent presentation that opened uh, perfectly this uh, AAC. Thank you.